This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. And I'm Nate Blyton. And this week we're happy to be joined by a friend of the show and founding editor of New Music Box, Frank J. O'Terry. Frank, thanks for being on the show this morning. Hey, it's good to be back. And uh, finally, this time we've got video, so you can actually see me as well as hear me. So. I know, I know. And <laughs> you, you do have an amazing apartment, too, as we can see by the hours and hours and hours of recorded music that are on your wall <laughs> behind you right now. Yes. <laughs> It's this never a dull moment. I think, no. you know, I was at your, your place a little while ago, and I, you can basically just pick any genre of any time period, and you will have a recording of it. Well, uh, it, chances are I'll probably have more than 10 recordings of it. Right. But, um, <laughs> and if we <laughs> line up all Frank's recordings back to back, we could stretch back to the Pleistocene era uh, <laughs> to listen to all of them once right, right. through, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is this is this is actually a big bone of contention. Um, you know, <laughs> many many years ago, I, I dated somebody who said, "There's no way you could possibly listen to all of this music that you have. You'd never get through it. There's no way you could read all the books that you have on the wall. Um, so you should just stop buying all this stuff because you're never going to get through it all." And uh, that relationship <laughs> ended. Um, <laughs> that person clearly doesn't understand ambition. I no, think is the no. problem. And, that's, and, that's what it's about. And there's nothing worse than being reminded of one's mortality. So Sure. Well, he's a man of posterity. Yes. Well, can I say, while, while we're still doing the introductory things, the new, the new redesign on, on New Music Box looks fabulous. I love the, the responsive design. It's, it, it, it's working great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I love it, too. And I have to say, you know, I have zero knowledge of web design, zero sense of the way things look. So I deserve zero credit for that. Um, that's actually the work of Eddie Ficklin, who is our brilliant um, tech person and who's also a composer, a fine composer and a librettist. I recently heard an opera that he did the libretto for that was very, very, very interesting mm. about the Emperor Hadrian of Rome. So, um, you know, every... It's. I, I think yet again, it, it shows that you know one of the, the joys of, of New Music Box is that everybody who's involved with creating it and and everybody involved with New Music USA, the organization where it's based, does creative activities as well. And I think when you see something like a great web design and say, well, you know, well this is was made by somebody who is also sensitive to art on a personal level in terms of making art, and I I think that makes the difference. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think, a really interesting thing. Composers and, and artists in general are, we, we do this because we're, in part, because we're very curious and we learn about all these other things and we like doing all these other things. And it's, it's really, I mean, that's w what we're doing here on Sound Notion too, is, and, and what you're doing with New Music Box, right? I mean, we, we f like read things that you write on the internet every, every week or so, but we also, you know, know you as, as a person that writes a lot of music and that's, that I think that's right. a really cool thing that, in particular, the internet has allowed us to do, where it's so easy to try these different things all the time, too. Exactly, and I and I think the other part of it is um, I think that people who are making work and are involved in either creating work, performing work, um, presenting work, bringing it forward, are really the folks that need to be speaking about it and addressing it, and we need to be responsible for the work and advocate for it and get it out there, and not just our own work, but the work of the rest of our community. I mean, we're really all in this together, I think. Yeah. Yes. So. I think there's a lot more mileage out of teaching new music people to be better at advertising and social media management and all that stuff, instead of trying to get the people who are interested in new music to hire professionals, air quotes for people who are listening only, to the you know, specialists in doing that stuff because they're so, my experience is that they're so disconnected from what that world means to the people involved that a lot of times you're kind of baffled at the things they say and the approaches they want to take. Well, Sam, you just wouldn't understand because you're not, you're not a professional. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to, to jump in with that. I don't know if anybody saw, I was kind of going viral on Facebook a couple of days ago, this comments that composers made about other composers yes. and it kind of <laughs> it sort of shattered my world a little bit because i always say well you know all these mean music critics out there who are not necessarily connected to this music who 
don't know about it, don't have a great interest in it. You know, part of the reason why New Music Box was created was so that we would have our own voice. We felt that you know, new music being made by by creators in the United States wasn't really given a fair deal in the mainstream media, and we thought, you know, we'll address this ourselves and and be open minded. And then I and I thought, okay, well, you know, composers should be writing about other people and advocating for them. And then this this thing drops on the internet of all these composers, you know, Saint Saens saying that Ravel is worthless and and what was it Tchaikovsky on Brahms and there were like tons of these things and I thought oh that's these guys are are even worse than Donald Henahan was and you know, the the, the and Copeland Harold the the one the cover one with Copeland talking about Ray von Williams is I think the best of all of them he says listening to the fifth symphony of Ray von Williams is like staring at a cow for 45 minutes <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I read that, and I don't know if you ever saw the original LP um, liner note for the first recording that was made of Terry Riley's In C. There was a no. comment by Paul Williams, who is not the Paul Williams singer-songwriter, who is now the um, the president of ASCAP. It was rather the it was a music critic who wrote for this thing called Crawdaddy Magazine, and they put this yeah. quote from the performance. To, and and this was used to sell the album, and it said something like, "Listening to In C is like staring in the mirror for forty five minutes, or looking at a window, or or watching the hands of a clock move." And that was used to sell it, you know. So I <laughs> I looked at this this quote of Copeland about Von Williams, like, you know, I never stared at a cow for forty five minutes. I'm a city boy, you know. Um, I <laughs> rarely ever stared at cows ever. So, you know, if, if Vaughn Williams' Fifth Symphony can do that for me, hooray. It, it like, you know, brings nature into my life. I actually think yeah. it's a quite a lovely piece. Whether that's what that, that was the intent of Copeland or not, I think we'll have to... Yeah, prob <laughs> probably not. For those of you not, without but... access to cows, you can just go listen to this album and get... Right. <laughs> exactly. This is like your, your cow substitute. Much well, like, I think we much need like your... corn. I think we need to realize that the, the people saying those things then were far more cultural luminaries than composers are these days you know um you were a, a cultural luminary composer with a capital c back then so yeah so saying something like that you know was it's a tw akin to like a rihanna and whatever her name was amanda Bynes, like twitter battle kind of thing you know because more people knew who those people were then than they than people know who whoever, Nico Muley or John Adams or anybody else is these days. I mean, I still kind of like Frank's idea of using this thing that's intended as, as like an insult to be the, the, the pull quote. You know, we, we used to joke, we, we, sure. one of the very early comments that was written about Sound Notion anywhere on the internet, we were just starting <laughs> and we had, we had not made very good shows for the first few months. And it takes a while to figure out how to do all the things. Somebody wrote, and I'm not going to name this person, but they're relatively famous, that we are reasonably intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, we, 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 we've been sticking with that one for the last couple of years. We're, we're reasonably intelligent. That's, that's that on the top quote. of our press kit. Right. There. Right. Right. Um, so, uh, Frank, what's new these days, compositionally for you? Oh, What's new these days? Well, I am in the process. It's, it's actually a long, drawn-out process. I'm collaborating with a playwright friend of mine on a music theater piece, um, opera, music theater. I mean, I, I sort of use the terms interchangeably. It, it, it is theater and it is, there is music. Whether or not the entire play will be set to music or it will be dialogue and parts that have music, is still yet to be determined, but that's that's a project that I've been working on whenever I can carve out time. I mean, collaborating is is trickier than writing a piece by oneself because, you know, when I write music by myself, I tend to get up at 5.30, 6 in the morning, turn on the, the computer, fire up Sibelius, and start working. But when you collaborate with somebody else, you have to you know, meet with that person and like schedule time, and that tends to not work at six in the morning too um mm -hmm. so you know that's that's the main thing i've been working on i have a commission from the young people's chorus of new york city um francisco nunez um but i don't need to write that until september 2014 so i haven't started it yet but i've got a lot of ideas brewing in my head about that but those are those are the things that are immediately is it supposed the, to, uh, is it going to be a, a larger work uh four minutes so four that's minutes. you know that that's 
I mean, that's pretty small. For me, sometimes it's harder to think smaller than larger with things you know, because I, I think of a bunch of things. Like, you know, years ago when Prism Saxophone Quartet asked me to write a minute piece for them for their 20th <laughs> anniversary, I wrote a piece and I, I said to them, you know, I wrote this thing, but I've got more ideas. I want to keep going. And it became the form movement fair and balanced. Sometimes it's it's hard to work within the time frame. But what I'm thinking is that if this thing works out and I write this piece for them, it might spiral into more pieces, either for them or for other choral groups. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll see. I love so idea. I like the idea of the uh, the this kind of like quasi opera staged thing. Uh, it seems like that's something that a lot of composers are interested in, and and maybe it's just that the we're reading more coverage about those kinds of projects, but it seems like that's a, a growing space. Is that, is that something you've seen? I mean, I, obviously you, uh, you know, get to see a lot of what's going on in a, in a very broad scope from your work with new music box. Is mm -hmm. that something you've, you've seen or is that just my imagination? No, I mean, you know, they, there's the, the cliche, you know, Everybody's writing an opera nowadays. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, for me, for me, there's no bandwagonism to it. The first music that I really came to love was Broadway music theater music. Is, that was the first stuff I was really exposed to growing up in New York City in the 70s. There was mainstream pop music on the radio that was everywhere that was ubiquitous. And then there was this Broadway thing. And through Broadway, I learned to love opera and through that learned to love um, for what, for lack of a better term, we call classical music, and then I heard the avant-garde stuff and got corrupted for life. Um, <laughs> but you know, Broadway was the first love and the first thing I really deeply immersed myself into. And I've written quite a few stage works over the years. Um, you know, I, I feel uncomfortable using the word either musical or opera because I think. Both of those words are loaded guns in a way, and you know people have certain associations that they bring to those words. Sometimes preclude doing something that's new and and individual with those words, or at least that's how I, I feel about it for me. But I, if I could speak a little bit more about the present piece, um, this collaboration, which we're calling tentatively, although I think we're going to stick with the name, Dr. Magnanimous. Um, it is somehow a cross between a performance art piece and a group therapy session. And, and um, the, the thing that makes it you know, particularly challenging and why it's sort of a slow process for me is we decided from the get-go to make it both practical and impractical. It will have six, possibly eight, but probably six characters in it only, and there will be no instruments at all. Wow. So it is unaccompanied six voices. And what it harkens back to, actually, is something even older than opera itself. The, in the 1580s and 1590s, there were these chains of madrigals that... Oh, that was weird. Something fell out of a pocket somewhere. I don't, oh, I see what happened. A lamp fell down. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> um, it's fine. It'll be fine. Um, you know, in the in the fifteen eighties and fifteen nineties there were these magical cycles that were sort of the forerunners of opera. People like Orazio Vecchi, Adriano Banchieri wrote these things that led to opera. So in a way we're kind of going back to the very, very beginning of what drama per musica was, at least in Europe. Of course, you know, ancient Greek plays were were musicals, were operas too, and the music that was done for all of those is mostly lost now. But, you know, it's an old idea, music, putting music and theater together. So when you said, this is a very long-winded way of answering your question, but, you know, when you said, well, is this a trend now of everybody suddenly writing opera? Well, you know, that's kind of what people have been doing since people have been creating music. They've been combining music with theater. And I think that separating music from theater is, is a much newer concept than having them together. That's interesting. No, I, and I think you're absolutely right, and, that, and I don't think that it's that people are necessarily, you know, doing it because it's cool. I think they're doing it because they think it's interesting, and I and there are a lot of opportunities for these works to to ha to be mounted these days, uh, and there are a lot of 
kind of small chamber opera company type things. I know we're, we're trying to avoid the word opera. I don't know a better word. Uh, this, this intermedia, is a, this is a problem. intermedia we are, art project. We have a language problem in new music. We don't even know yes. what to call new music. Yes. <laughs> I, well, you know, when, when my, the, the piece I, I did with Lucio Pozzi was staged in Lithuania, we decided not to call it an opera. We called it a performance oratorio. And, you know, an oratorio, people think of as basically an opera that's not staged. So what if you staged an oratorio? It was kind of turning the word upside down, back in on itself. And Lucio liked it because it made reference to performance art. And he's done a lot of performance art pieces over the years. And and it worked for me because we got to avoid that word opera. So, also, no one has to pay grant rights. Well, you know, I tried, I tried, <laughs> I tried that. I tried, you know, for me... I'm really bad at negotiating stuff, so I love that all my small rights stuff is covered by ASCAP. And I said, well, you know, this isn't an opera, so can I get a p- performance right on this? And they're like, uh-uh-uh. No, this is, this is a grand rights piece. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> uh, you know, um, it all worked out, though. I am no regrets. So, just Frank, are you it- at... Li- I'm just going to start calling anything like that whatever word occurs to me at the time. It is a research paper in four acts. Yeah. <laughs> um, Frank, are you at liberty to say who you're collaborating with on Dr. Magnanimous? I don't yeah, think of you really. Oh, okay. Yes, of course. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah Daniel Nudell, who um, is a playwright. I've actually been friends with him since 1987. We were high school teachers together at Martin Luther King High School back in 1987 and um we always talked about collaborating it never quite worked out all these years and he wrote a bunch of poetry and wrote some novels but then he started writing plays and a couple of years ago he asked me to write some incidental music for a play that he wrote and i did that um it was a a whole electronically generated score and i said okay he said no microtones you're not you're not i don't want any microtones in this i said okay well i'll do this but everything has to be in quintuple <laughs> meter. And so every every section of music that's in this thing has five beats per measure because So you you, know, just, you just want to piss him off, basically. Well I you know, I, I, I just can't <laughs> I can't do things that are just diatonic and duple meter and I mean I can, but I'd rather do something else, you know? I, I I think it's sometimes fun though to try to make something weird within the that it's really hard though because I feel like we've all adjusted our ears to not think that there's anything at all that you could possibly make weird out of a diatonic collection. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, I've I've done I've certainly done things that that are diatonic. I think I think for me, it's not so much wanting to make something weird. I rather take the weird things like 5-4 time or 36 tone equal temperament or, you know, what have you, and make them not weird. Yeah. yeah. It's no, more that. It's more that that's propelling me than the other thing. Mm-hmm. So. Finding some real, something that feels natural. And beautiful. Nate, you're real soft. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, and five, I mean, look, we've got five fingers on our hand. <laughs> Why aren't five beat cycles more common they should just can't feel fiveness very well and i don't know how it ended up that way but we sure can not we have we have isle of the dead like learning how to i actually (laughs) and i've actually spent time in my career investing in trying to feel fiveness you know like doing fives to myself all the time yeah and And sevens Seven, seven feels so normal. Five, like fiveness and sevenness. To be honest, you know, there was a time when you know when you first start learning music or learning playing an instrument or something, you get something in seven. It's like, oh my god, what is happening right now? Right. And like now, you know, at this at, at this point in my life, and like, and probably everyone's life, like seven is like it doesn't even. There's not the slightest hint of awkwardness in seven I don't at all. Think that, that exists for five, but I think that's just because we listen to this music that that doesn't treat them as weird, right? Right, and for, and writ, write a lot of music that doesn't treat them as weird, right? right? Yeah, and I, I do a lot. Like what Frank was saying is, is something that I do that I try to do in a lot of my music is to make something that is you know, you know 
on the on the surface an unusual thing feel like that's the 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 consonant idea of the 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 you know comfortable part but i i we've listened to a lot of music that does that and mm -hmm. i i don't think that what you're describing patrick would be the case to to a lot of people well, you know years ago i i met with this guy who does who curates what's called library music do you guys know that term in mm -hmm. films um for tv commercials yeah. and you know they assemble library music and we were at some reception in L.A. It was one of these ASCAP I Create Music Expo things that I was attending that year. And he said, you know, you should submit some of your music for this and you can make a lot of money, blah, 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 blah. And I said, you know, hey, it would be great to make money because I could travel more. I can buy more records and you know, live slightly better. But that, that isn't really what propels me. But I, I love the idea of having music that was in a commercial jingle that was in five, four time or seven, eight time yeah. and was yeah. in quarter tones. And so right. I said, yeah, you know, there's nothing I would prefer than to, to do this thing that everybody would be humming that's, you know, in quarter tones. And they'd be humming this quarter tone melody and it'd be in five and it'd be in seven. And he's like, well, you don't really understand what it means to write <laughs> music or commercial. So that was, that was the beginning and end of that prospect Funny. for me. Uh... But I, you know, I really do think, you know, there's nothing I, I would love more than for these things that people think are weird to have people hear that, in fact, they're not weird. You know, that they right. are just as natural as everything else. And the diatonic... More natural. Yeah. yeah. Just less in familiar. In some cases, yeah. I mean, the, the diatonic scale, um, you know, 12-tone equal temperament, duple meter, these are all things that are wonderful, but their dominance is somewhat arbitrary. It just played out that way. So it would be very interesting to have things play out differently. And, you know, a lot of people talk about, when you say more natural, the just intonation scale, you know, in equal temperament, we can get really technical about this. You've got these great fifths, but you've got thirds that are sharp. And if you had these pure thirds and pure sevenths, you know, if you had pure elevenths, a pure eleventh is a quarter tone interval, and there are some refrigerators that hum, and they'll hum with that interval. It's it's like something that naturally occurs. In fact, I think many years ago, Johnny Reinhardt, who runs the American Festival of Microtonal Music, pointed out to me that the Oldsmobile car horn has that quarter tone, that eleven eight interval in it. It just so happened that way. I mean, these things occur. Awesome. But you sort of lock them out of out of common parlance. Mm. So. Well, that actually brings up an interesting question, and Frank, you might be just the person to answer this. Yes. <laughs> I, I've encountered people, I do not have the skill, but I've encountered people who have what, what is referred to as perfect pitch, mm -hmm. teaching, uh, being a, a grad assistant for an oral skills class. There were two kids in this class who had perfect pitch, meaning you could play a note on an equally tempered piano, and they would tell you what it is with no problem, right. without fail. Right. And But people treat that as if it's some sort of a natural skill. I mean, people will say you can learn it, but these kids both said, I just had it. But right. that's not a natural thing. Do you know anything or have any thoughts about that? Because equal temperament is not a naturally occurring thing. So how right. could it be a naturally ingrained skill? Right. I mean, I, I think, you know, there there are all these arguments, and, and we can get into a whole, you know, psychoacoustic talks about this. I'm not a scientist per se. Um this idea of perfect pitch versus relative pitch versus what I call perfect relative pitch, which doesn't sound like it makes much sense. But, you know, years ago, I listened to Carmina Burana a lot when I first got the LP. So that E that begins at, ah, oh, Fortuna, I always had that E in my head. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of burned its way in there. And there was a B flat in this piece that I wrote that I don't really think very much of anymore that I wrote when I was in 10th grade, which was a sonata for piano and organ that never got played that began with a B flat. And I always heard that B flat in my head and that B flat and E are a tritone away from each other. And based on that tritone, I have what I consider to be perfect relative pitch, but it's not perfect pitch per se, because I have to stop and think about it a little bit mm. and it's associative. Um, I think that people can hear specific sounds um, is it just, it might just be a matter of memory. Well, yeah, it is, it is a memory thing. And with 12 tone equal temperament, you know, that's the tuning system that everybody's exposed to now, but it, it could theoretically be possible for somebody to have perfect quarter tonal pitch or perfect just intonation pitch or perfect 
any pitch if they were immersed in that system. Alosh Haba, the the Czech Moravian composer, who I think I spoke about last, I think that yeah, even you did. the title of this this episode claimed that he had perfect pitch within seventy two tone equal temperament, which is twelfth tones. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I it's it's completely believable. Yeah, that's interesting. Added. We I I had a professor that used to joke that they were he was one of one of his friends who's a theorist was was going to try to raise his baby listening only to serial music <laughs> the whole the kid's life to see if that like when when this kid was was old enough to like understand how music was put together if having listened to serial music all of, all of his life would kind of be able to intuit these uh these row structures that that we now think of as relatively difficult to impossible to hear these these row transformations right, if, right. if he had listened to it his whole life and had not grown up understanding things like uh you know octave equivalency and the the fifth relationship being special and all these other things that we associate with tonal music if if he had only grown up listening to uh, to 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 like the from from Schoenberg to Babbitt, like how how would this kid experience this serial music differently? Uh, but of course, this theorist's wife was never going to allow that to happen. <laughs> oh, so it didn't happen? Oh, no, that happen. was just something that they say, used to you know, fantasize about. I think. Yeah, research opportunity lost. <laughs> yeah, well, totally. you know, yeah, totally. I mean, well, I would say to this, you know, it's interesting, not allow this to happen. Oh, the poor kid, you know, having right. to be exposed to serial music. You know, why would that be any worse than being exposed to anything else? To, to baby Mozart. Exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, why not, you know, baby Webern, you know, why not have... Oh, man, <laughs> right? we, just, we just hatched a, the, the, our first million dollar idea here on Sound Notion, baby Webern. <laughs> Baby Vaburn might um, be a show title too. Just just keep him away, keep keep Baby Vaburn away from the cigarettes. That would be the you know. yeah right right. That, and those are the new rules now for 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 pregnant women is is no no shellfish, no soft cheeses, uh, no tonal music. Right. right. <laughs> um, you know, I I w- I would say though, you know, where I would have gone with this um, is it would have been interesting to think in terms of other tonal systems, other temperaments, other tunings, um, not necessarily hearing music without a tonal center, but what if, what if exposure to 12-tone equal temperament, which is now so ingrained, wasn't as ingrained, I guess. Um, what I would say for all of that, though, is I think you'd run after, out of music after a while. I think that people inadvertently hear tonal music that they're not even listening to they're just hearing it in the background and you know there are no 12 tone serial commercial jingles unfortunately you know they're you know they that wasn't no 31 tone equal tempered commercial jingles too bad um (laughs) though i do so i think my ears latch on to whatever the weirdest part of whatever the weirdest tune is that's in the popular consciousness i feel we probably all do this like oh that was a really weird leap in that melody yeah right Uh, therefore i like it um (laughs) one of my favorite things years ago i i think it was before all of your times collectively um but eight i think it was at&t had a commercial and they used meredith monk's dolman music on it really? it was like the most amazing thing and cool. you know there it was and but you see that's what needs to happen in terms of getting these other sounds in the public consciousness in an unconscious way it needs to be out there and it needs to be stuff that we hear and then all of a sudden it isn't so weird anymore and it isn't so difficult to process so mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there was yeah, this baby Bayburn for everybody. Just a few yeah. years ago, there was this Geico ad that had this weird, like, uh, Scandinavian electro pop duo thing, and there was this really weird leap in the melody. It's like it's always something to remind me of another place and time. And I always thought that was really interesting. Was that like? Oh yeah, weird, no, that's uh, of that's place and time. Yeah, he's Roy, Roy Scott he's standing there on the Roy moving Scott walkway. Yeah, he's a, yeah. But oh. anyway, it was like this really weird melody, and I always enjoyed catching that ad because it had. It was this always on the weird, uh, quirky Geico thing. commercials. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, maybe this is the strategy for people that are writing commercial jingles is to write them weirder and then they'll stick in, in, in the minds of broken people like us. 
<laughs> and we'll start buying stuff. We'll like totally. enter the consumer market. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, there's right? somebody. I, you know, here we go. I'm going to say this, and it's going to be out there in the public sphere. If if somebody decides to advertise for a product using 36 tone equal temperament, I will buy their product. Okay, <laughs> hands down. <laughs> All right. So w the you first company that customer. sells like that needs to sell like one enormous thing. You know, you got one guaranteed customer. You need to sell yeah. your your privately owned space shuttle business. <laughs> Commemorative solid gold footballs. Uh oh. Right. <laughs> Use thirty six tone equal temperament, and Frank's on board. Yes. Man, I need to get some gold. Um, you know, related to the issue of like exposing the public to more sophisticated, I guess we might say, music by getting it then, into advertising. I don't like that. You're gonna have to use another word. Yeah. <laughs> Take that yeah. back. More, so. Take that back. I demand it. <laughs> More nuance rich music? No, I wouldn't even go for that. Um, something that's different than what they're used to hearing, you know, N a okay. different paradigm. Okay. But a, a big issue I have with a lot of like uh, music that is used in advertising, which is music from the pop world, is the way it's recorded. Because I've had the opportunity lately to listen to a lot of, I contrast what the stu my students like in the pop music world and like take the musical elements I'm trying to teach them and relate it to that music. And when we listen to it in class, the, the tonal, I mean, the uh, dynamic range of the music is so tiny compared to um, classical recordings. It's depressing. Like it, it doesn't change volume as much as it gets thicker and thinner, but the volume is so narrow. Well, that's just compression. You know what I mean? Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? I mean, I know. And, and I think they try to make up for that in timbral and, uh, yeah, timbral and textural kind of changes. And, and that's the thing where recorded music really, really, really has some strength. And not, not that acoustic music doesn't have that either, but that's like <laughs> the strength it does have for lack of the, the literal, like, dynamic range. Mm. But, yeah. Anyway, that's yeah. my beef. Not, not that there's anywhere to go from there. Yeah, yeah. Right. way to drive the conversation. <laughs> right, right. Right. Well, chances are, you know, that you know, most of these things you're hearing, um, things that are designed for television. I mean, television has terrible, you know, standalone TVs. Now we have like TVs with extra speakers and things, but most people to this day, TVs in their home, it's not good audio that's right. coming out of them. So you don't necessarily, if you create something that's in great audio, the people who are going to be hearing it are not necessarily going to be hearing the great audio. And you know, this, is, this was an interesting argument in the 70s. There, there were all these pop records that were mastered for AM radio airplay. AM mm -hmm. radio is atrocious. It is atrocious. So, it's you know, horrible. It, it was an atrocious <laughs> audio signal, but it reached loads of people you know, in their trucks, in their cars, wherever. Right. And so, you know, you listen back to, say, John Denver's records from the 70s, and there are a lot of really, really fine songs in there, and actually pretty solid performances, but the recording quality is wretched because it was done, it was EQ'd specifically to maximize the potential of broadcast on AM radio. Hmm. So, Yeah, that's, that's a very good I point. Th and I, I think that's a good parallel to make because, like, I, so many of my friends, their whole experience of music is either in earbuds or in like MacBook speakers, you know? Yeah, dreadful. Right. Dreadful, dreadful. Yeah. They, they, and, they need to get themselves turntables, you know, they get, get the speakers going. And yeah, I, I very rarely will listen to music on headphones. I really like it out in the air. And I also like to share it with other people. Um, the, I mean, the problem with the earbud thing is it's kind of it's your own sound world and you can't share it and sure you can get one of those y cables and share it with one other person um right. but you know that's not quite the same as having a group of people over and putting on a record and having everybody listen to something together and and then be able to talk about it and think about it and with your favorite vintage exactly <laughs> precisely yes yes well, um, I mean, and, and it's not appropriate just, varietal it's, to it's go not with just the collection. technology, it's the thing itself, right? We're listening to all, all the compressed audio and, yes. and, and the, or the, the compressed files and people are, I mean, people grow up today listening to music almost entirely on YouTube, which is right. super compressed beyond even normal because you're having to throw the video down the pipe too, but... 
I mean, there's yeah. there's this great um, this this hilarious video that was designed to be a way to like test your 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 hearing range, and it was on YouTube. And so because of the data compression on YouTube, like the highest end of the spectrum <laughs> is not being played anyway because right. it's all been taken out. So it makes you think that you can't hear very high at all because YouTube is not capable of sending those high frequencies to your computer. Right. Wow. <laughs> it's, it was hilarious when somebody showed this to me. It was pretty hilarious. You know, uh, actually... Dovetailing on what Frank said about being in the presence of music, I tell you, I told you guys I went to a, a drag show last night, and I haven't been in the presence of that kind of bass response, like physically oh, yeah. in the presence of that kind of bass response, in a long time, I realized. And man, it's just shaking your body, you know? Because you can imagine that's... the kind of music was, was being played for the drag show, but man, that's, it's, it's, uh, you know, I know Tim, uh, has a big thing about feeling the bass move through objects and move through your body. And it's, it's, a, it's a thing. It's an experience. I'm glad I got to do it. Subsonics. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Um, Go ahead, so Patrick. Frank, I, I kind of wanted to ask Frank about, yeah. um, some of his recent articles. Oh, okay. Uh oh, <laughs> now we're getting serious. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is the part of the show that will require you to do some homework. So get out your yeah. paper and pencil. Right, right, right. Patrick's <laughs> going to give you the reading assignment. <laughs> 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 no, no. I, uh, in, in, I think you had a really great post um, about New York City Opera and opera in general in New York. And you brought forth some interesting numbers that maybe a lot of people weren't aware of before. Well, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's interesting um, you know, in... The last days of City Opera, there, when they were set to declare a bankruptcy, there were there was all this vitriol online saying, "Well, you know, we don't really need City Opera. We have the Metropolitan Opera. We, you know, we we don't. New York City doesn't need two opera companies." And and I thought to myself, "Well, first of all, New York City doesn't only have two opera companies. New York City has lots of opera companies. They're just a lot smaller." than those two companies were. But when everybody pointed to the fact that, well, you know, now that the Met is doing contemporary, more contemporary opera than they used to, we don't really need city opera. And I thought, well, you know, how much contemporary opera is the Met doing? It's very exciting that they've commissioned Nico Muley and they're staging his opera. I'm going tomorrow night to hear it. And... Um, you know that's the only new opera they're doing this year. The new, the new operas they're doing this year are "The Nose" by Shostakovich, which is amazing. <laughs> I went to it last week, um, but you know it's ninety years old, and Shostakovich has been dead. He died before any of you were born, I think. Um, so to call that new music is a bit of a stretch. Um, Benjamin Britten's um, "Midsummer Night's Dream," which I went to, I got to support. You know. Them doing 20th century music is a big deal. So I've got to support when they do 20th century music. But, you know, that's the last century. And that opera was written in 1960. That was before I was born. That's not new music. Right. Um, you know, and, and, and the thing that really got me riled up is people said, well, City Opera went out of business because all they did was they, they abandoned accessible programming and did all of this new music. Um, this season... They only managed to do Anna Nicole. But if you looked at the rest of their season, Anna Nicole was the only one of the four operas by a living composer on the season. Last season, they did Powder Her Face by Thomas Addis, right. which was the only opera by a living composer on the season. They did a Benjamin Britten opera. Benjamin Britten, this is the Britten centenary year. It's a no-brainer to do Britten this year. But they, they did Rossini, Offenbach, Mozart. That's not new music. Yeah, you know, so... Where's where's the accessible? Where's all this inaccessible contemporary music? And I should point out, in those last two seasons, they didn't program a single work by an American composer. So all of this vitriol that's saying, well, City Opera went under because it's doing all this work by you avant-garde American composers that nobody wants to hear. It's it's baloney because that's not what they've been programming. 
Well, and even the stuff that they are programming is is relatively accessible new stuff. Exactly. Right? Like, and turnage, turnage is not boulez. No. And the other part of it is, you know, I was at Anna Nicole. You couldn't, all the seats were full. They were. These performances were sold out. So the <laughs> repertoire choices were not the problem. So that was really got me, what got me all riled up. But when you talked about lists, it, it's interesting to remember all of these important American operas that basically got their birth by city opera, as opposed to the Met's legacy. When the Met opened, they opened with Samuel Barber's second opera, which got totally trashed by the critics at the time. And they were so sort of, you know, jarred by that. They did one other opera the following season, Morning Becomes Electra by Marvin David Levy. And from that time, it was a full 24 years before they premiered, commissioned to premiere in another opera, John Corleano's Ghosts of Versailles. 24 years without a single new work on that stage. That's kind of shocking. That was my, that was my gob smacked moment when I was reading this piece, Frank. I just couldn't believe that. However, yeah. was there everybody one that was supposed to be here. Music- yeah, well, well, there are two. You know, there are two footnotes to that to that statistic. One footnote is that Einstein on the Beach was staged in its American premiere. It had two performances in November of 1976 during those years, but that wasn't a work that was commissioned by the Met. It wasn't presented by the Met. It was basically the Met was a hall that was empty those nights, and they the creators and the producers got the Met for those nights and did it there. So the Met was not responsible for Einstein. Um, you know, retroactively, they might want to take credit for it, but that's not why it was there. Um, they did, however, commission Jacob Druckmann mm-hmm. to write an opera based on Medea, and it never happened. And I don't know the whole story of that, and it's a shame. It would have been great to hear it, but it never happened. So, you know, you could say, okay... Well, they were supposed to do one, and by dumb luck, they got folks who rented out the hall, and they got one. So big whoop, they had one in 24 years. But I don't give them credit for that either. They didn't do a new opera in two dozen years. That's amazing. And, you know, um, you could put footnotes on it, and you you can explain the details of the history. I know the history, so if anybody wants to argue and say, whoa, 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 we were going to do this. This Jacob Druckmann opera, oh, and we did Einstein on the Beach. It's like okay, two pieces. Even if I want, even if you want to have credit for that, they should be doing a new opera every season. Hello, yeah. you know, yeah. and I mean, just sitting, one. They do a lot of operas every season. Yeah, I mean, they should theoretically do more than one, but I'll I'll take one. You know, we could do yeah. with one, and and City Opera, New York City Opera, which was the opera of the people. Yeah, you know, they were down to doing four works a year. Um, yeah, they should have been doing all new work. They were accused of doing all new work, so they might as well have just done it. <laughs> Go for it, yeah. You know? Yeah, um, and, and they were selling all the new work. They were, yes. like you said, the, I, I read somewhere that, that uh, Anna Nicole was 95% sold every single night. That's, yeah. wow. that's amazing for, for any opera, much less a brand new one. It, yeah, it's it's and it's astonishing that they've gotten all this heat. It's I, I mean, nobody wants to start a fight with Local 802, but... I don't know what's going on there and what their beef is with new music. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean if you're going to go ahead. Yeah, I mean the problem, I mean the problem there, I mean the thing that say in terms of Local 802, I mean Local 802 represents is supposed to represent all musicians and that includes many composers. So, right. I you know, I don't think it's to to group Local 802 as one giant monolith. I don't think it's a monolith. I think it's unfortunate that somebody who is in the position of being a spokesperson for 802 essentially, I would say, put foot in mouth by saying that it was an abandoning of accessible repertoire. Um, It's sad that, you know, that broad stroke becomes representative of a position of 802, whereas this is one person's statement and he happens to be an 802 rep. That's but true. I think if you yeah. take if you take the rank and file, and if you were to poll everybody, I mean, there are tons of people in 802 who are playing new music, who are writing new music, who embrace new music. Um, you know, it's a shame 
that we have people who are supposed to be representing us, the greater we who who choose to divide and conquer and play an us versus them game when in fact, you know, there is no them. You know, yeah. we're we're all in this together. And you know, that that was unfortunate. And you mm -hmm. know, that would be my read on it. I was hoping that somebody from 802 would have responded. You know, you were saying there were lots of responses. And there were responses. There were actually people who turned around and said, it was amazing. There was this guy, this British filmmaker, who put this thing in response to my my essay saying, well, all those operas you named, every one of them was forgotten five minutes after the last performance. So you see, you just proved the point. City Opera, by spending all this energy with new opera, that's what bankrupted them. And I said, well, you know, that's interesting because... It's not true. Five minutes after the last performance, um, Lizzie Borden by Jack Beeson was shown on national television in its original run. It was revived 20 years later and shown on television again. That's more than five minutes. Um, you know, the Crucible by Robert Ward received the Pulitzer Prize, which is one of the biggest prizes for a piece of music, and that happened more than five minutes after the closing performance. And I just kind of went on with that whole list with him, right. and he, he never responded back. But well, then you have to have a different standard. Like, none of this yeah. is going to, like, none of this is Kanye West, right? None of this is, is, is going platinum. Well, okay, you know, this, this ties back into our earlier discussion. You know, if, if these things were played on commercials and people heard them and there was exposure, you know, you were saying that Anna Nicole sold better than most operas. I would venture to say part of why it sold so well, first of all, is Anna Nicole is somebody that the general public knew and was able to identify with. And City Opera and BAM, who co-produced it with City Opera, had an incredible advertising campaign around New York City. There were ads for Anna Nicole on the subway. Yeah. You, know, you, could not, you could not go anywhere without seeing Anna Nicole this, yeah. Anna Nicole that, with their decolletage all, <laughs> all in front of you. But, you know, that's great. That's what needs to happen. It needs to be in your face. And I would argue that the reason sports is so dominant, say, in our culture, and, and a broader variety of music isn't, is because sports is in our face. It's the back page of the tabloids. It's every time you watch the news, the last five minutes of the news, or the last ten minutes, or this is the sports section, and there's no, you know culture section there's no art section and you know i don't say oh it's a shame you know we're not having mark anthony turnage or or boulez or 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 um you know patrick gulo or david mcdonald or sam Rosiers or nate bilton or frank joe terry's music you know on the news every day that that's not happening and we're having kanye west instead i wouldn't i wouldn't draw those parallels you know put kanye on there too make it a level playing field, but show people through mainstream media the variety of stuff that's out there and, I, and make it as relevant to our society as sports is. And, you know, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent here, but I, 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 I just kind of can't help myself. They did, uh, they did some survey some years ago, and they lumped all music together, which is good. They, they should do that. More people have attended, more people attend live music performances than attend sports games. Right. That was amazing to me. Yet, in terms of coverage by the media, sports is so dominant in the media and, you know, will fund a football stadium and will not fund a concert hall. We'll use tax dollars to do that. And But certainly yet, that's different from viewing a sports game. Yeah, but what TV station is going to broadcast an opera? You know, if, right. if any station... Well, that's my point. Well, that's the point. If they did, well, once it's the collusion of the media. The media has made sports into this empire by broadcasting it, and you could say, well, um, it, it costs a lot of money. You know, Local 802 is going to charge such and such for, for television rights to show them on the air, and if it's a piece of new music, it's grand rights, it's yak, 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 you have to pay the composer, the publisher, the this, the that. They are paying a ton of money to put Major League Baseball on television and to put the NFL on television. 
you know, people are getting remuneration. And with all the complaints about the amount of money that musicians and orchestras are making, that's one of the big you know, rallying cries with people. Oh, they're getting so much money, and they're doing this this thing that's pleasurable to them. And you know, they're 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 you know they they shouldn't be getting such high salaries. Look at the amount of money that the the sports guys are getting. It's yeah. astronomical. And you know, if you would make this investment into culture, and you know, here's the crux of my rant with all of this. Sports is very valuable in that it shows you that through a group activity you can succeed. And that is a very, very important lesson, an important humanization lesson to learn, which is why it's a valuable thing. But the pernicious thing about it is, yes, you have this group activity that you come together to succeed, but in order to succeed, someone else has to fail. In order for that group of people to win, another group of people has to lose. And the reason music is a better metaphor is it brings people together. People come together and make music. They make this glorious sound. And guess what? Nobody lost. There are winners. There's no loser. Well, you know, Frank, that's, using the sports analogy is a perfect segue into another story um, that we've got on the docket this week about uh, Phyllis represent, representative, representative Phyllis Kahn from Minnesota has introduced a bill that would establish community ownership of the orchestra there in Minnesota. And as we all know, and we've covered on the show, they've been having lots of issues. The players have been locked out for over a year now, right? Yeah. Bye. Um, yeah, so you make a very strong point. Whereas lots of cities support, you know, like Detroit, <laughs> supporting the building of a new hockey arena, aren't they, while they're going through well, bankruptcy? they're bankrupt. <laughs> like, yeah. literally. Yeah. And they're and they're willing um, to sell off everything in their art museum, which is that's astonishing, un unbelievable. Yeah. It's it's so the the argument. There's a very clear argument in my view to to say that municipalities would would be way better off, and there's way more sort of altruistic value in supporting a cultural institution like an orchestra rather than a sports team. Um, well, and, and all, the model for this is is the the that. Representative Khan, and we should say she's a, a state representative to avoid yeah. confusion. She's not a U.S. Congress person. Um, is Good thing. her her model is uh, the Green Bay Packers, which as as you may not know if you don't follow football, uh, they are a nonprofit. They're a community owned nonprofit, and the local people of of Green Bay. Are, are, I mean, it's not a big enough market to support a professional team in the traditional model. There, there's not enough. There aren't enough people that can afford to to pay the the ridiculous ticket prices or the the uh, broadcasting fees or anything like that. And so they're actually literally community owned, and people in Green Bay own shares in the Green Bay Packers. And this is what Representative Khan is proposing for the Minnesota Orchestra, which uh, I think would would be a delightful thing to try. I wonder if it would have an impact on the way that, that they uh, do the, the, the kinds of outreach that the Minnesota Orchestra is famous for if they were actually owned by the people that they were in, in part trying to reach out to. Well, yeah. it addresses that topic somewhat in the story. It says no one person could own more than a 5% stock, uh, and at least 50% of the ownership should be sold to members of the public. So, you know, entities can buy in, but only at 5%, and at least half has to go to individual members of the community. And there's also a note, I don't know where it is exactly in the piece, that the artistic decisions, which we have to assume that outreach and advertising decisions would fall under that, would not be made by the board of directors. So, in other words, the artistic director, the, the arts part of the organization would still be doing the art stuff, which is good. And and I hope they would still be able to continue to support the Composers Institute, which has been doing fantastic work. And we talked to Aaron J. Kernis, the former director of that Composers Institute, last week. And the, something like this, I don't know how it would impact their ability to to work with those uh, that to do those things that are uh, outside of the 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 kind of strict interpretation of what orchestras do. Well, what I have to say, I, I want to jump in here and say, you know, this is, a, I think, potentially a great idea, 
But if that orchestra is owned by the community, whether it's you know the Minnesota Orchestra, I want to I want to make it abstract and take it to any orchestra, and you know make a theoretical you know Green Bay Philharmonic. Let's say sure. you know, let's let's put mm-hmm. it back in in Green Bay. I don't think there is a Green Bay <laughs> Philharmonic, so we can talk about them. In the abstract, um, you know, the Green Bay Philharmonic that is publicly owned the way the Green Bay Packers are, this make-believe orchestra I'm envisioning, would have to be as relevant and as pertinent and as beholden to the community as that football team. The goal of the football team is to win for that city. So the the opposing teams who challenge them lose, and Green Bay wins. Therefore, Green Bay is the winner. In music... Everyone's a winner, as I said, but but who's winning? You know, Mozart is wonderful music, Beethoven is wonderful music, but if that's all you're feeding the people of Green Bay in your orchestra, why should the community own you? What does that have to do with 21st century American life? The center of it has to be living composers from this country. Yeah, but this, this, and this would turn into something that you hate, Frank, which is competitions. Well... You know, I, something that I hate. Um, I I believe in there being opportunities for as many people as possible, and I tend to not like paradigms where somebody wins and therefore others lose. And you know, I always like to find ways to rotate it around. But that I mean, that's that's my own personal thing. People are going to have different methods by which they choose things. And the Minnesota Orchestra Composers Institute, a wonderful program that existed, you know, for more than a decade, there were many submissions to that. Obviously, not everybody who submitted a work got their work played, but thankfully, they didn't pick one person and say, oh, this person's the best, and therefore nobody else gets played. It was always a group of people. And I understand that there aren't going to be resources to do every single score that got submitted. Would that there were. You know, would that there were an opportunity to have readings of every single thing that was submitted. But that would, you know, that would need a lot more revenue. That, that would be like Frank's record collection. Exactly. <laughs> it, takes, it takes a long time. But, you know, I mean, I think it's something to aspire to. Um, but, you know, what if an entire concert season was built out of this idea of we're only going to do music by local composers. This, this theoretical yeah. Green Bay Philharmonic, it's, it's an entire season of composers who live in Green Bay. Well, and that's, you better believe I'd get, I'd get the next flight out there. I'd be there. And, and, and I, I want to hear A lot of stuff. the thing to remember about the, the Composers Institute is that it's not just... The, like, the point of the Composers Institute was not just to... Uh, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't use the past tense. It's not just to like get these these people performances, but also to help teach young composers how to write for orchestra because those opportunities to to practice doing it and hear what the thing is that you created sounds like are so rare that it's it's a, a mentoring thing as much as anything. And in that in that regard, the the competition for those spots is a, I think a little reminiscent of the competition to get into Harvard or, or some, you know, prestigious university that if if they could educate everyone to the levels that, that they would like to, they would, but they can't, there aren't enough slots, there aren't enough classes, there aren't enough professors. And so, but the thing is, it shouldn't be so rare. It should sure. not be so rare. You know, why is it that there's only one opera being done by the Met by a contemporary American composer this season? And, you know, why was there a 24-year hiatus? Why doesn't every orchestra in the country do works by living composers? Every, not, not just every season, every concert. You know, we talk about relevance. You know, we talk about, you know, what's going to bring people into this stuff and make, make them care about it. Yeah, you know, Mozart and Brahms and Tchaikovsky, I mean, these are all wonderful, wonderful composers. And I don't say stop playing them, but don't only play them. If there's a program that's got, you know, a Brahms symphony on it, everything else on that program should be newer music. Yeah. Mm. That, how do you convince people to, to, that that's a valuable thing, though? The, the, the problem is that the, I don't think see value in things after that. And that's, I think, something that requires a I mean, bit that's of a something that, and it, Yeah, it affects ticket sales, certainly. 
Well, once again, you know, it's it's marketing, and Anna Nicole, it's it's funny. I'm I'm going to throw City Opera forward as you know an amazing job in marketing a performance. It's 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 sort of sad and and bittersweet that it turned out to be their last one, but they did an incredible job getting people into the hall for that gig. They did. I mean, I'd say I'd say the, the whole marketing put. It's funny though because. The real marketing push that came from that whole production really was on BAM's side. You know, yeah. New York City, they, they provided the players, the musicians, but I mean, like, the machine that drove that whole campaign was BAM. And they did a brilliant job. And, you know, it, I think you can sell anything to anybody. I mean, you know, the, the old P.T. Barnum adage. But I think, it's, I think it's actually true. I think if you have ads on buses... You know, if you have things in, in you know, airports, if people are saturated with these sounds, they're going to want to know what they are. So what I'm wondering is, too, I mean, like, so lately I've been seeing a lot of Two Boys ads uh, yes. in the subway. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, whether you can take it or leave it with, with Norman, uh, <laughs> you know, apparently there's some information about ticket sales not being so great. For Midsummer, Two Boys, and The Nose. Now, I don't really know what if that's if, you know what the, what how how true that is, or I mean, like I guess you could you know what what was the when you went to The Nose, what was the turnout? Two Boys is the muley, by the way, in case yeah. you're not following. Yeah, um, The Nose was pretty packed. We were we were up in the in family circle, which was pretty packed. I couldn't really see down into the orchestra to see if every seat was taken, but it was pretty full up where we were and, you know, down in the balcony. And, and mind you, this, this wasn't the first performance. This is somewhat late into the run. Um, but it was, it was, you know, they, that's, that's a lot of seats to fill. I mean, and that's, this is the other thing I have to say, you know, we talk about building these huge concert halls and these big stadiums. Obviously the Met is a very special case, but, you know, why must we always build these gigantic, gigantic spaces, whether it's a football stadium or a symphony concert hall or an opera house? What about having a slightly smaller hall? You know, one of the, the political lesson of the 1960 presidential election between John F. Kennedy and, and Richard Nixon is JFK always booked his rallies in smaller spaces that were burst to capacity, and Nixon might have actually had more people at a number of rallies, but he booked in, or he didn't book, but his people booked in larger spaces. So it looked like it was empty, and JFK's spaces looked like they were completely full. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you create, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was a very smart tactical maneuver, but I, I think it translates into, into the concert hall experience. You know, not every piece works well in a giant hall not even just in terms of attracting an audience but in terms of how it's going to sound in that space so you know and it would actually be cheaper to build the smaller hall too well i think at the risk of this conversation going for another couple of hours i think (laughs) we should move on to our pick of the week uh sam is not at home so he does not have access to the the pick of the week machine uh, that spit that spools us up. But our pick of the week this week is uh, from, uh, as usual, our guest. The pick of the week. That there was, you go. That was, that was nice, actually. It's good improvisation. Um, it's from <laughs> our guest Frank Oteri. Uh, we have uh, an excerpt from uh, a, a song cycle called "Versions of the Truth." Frank, do you want to maybe explain the, uh, the the progeny of this work? Yeah, yeah. This was this was a piece that was commissioned by the ASCAP Foundation Charles Kingsford Fund, and it's a fund that was set up specifically to perpetuate art songs and song cycles. And so, I was commissioned to write a song cycle, and I decided to do a cycle. My wife is an incredible pianist, Trudy Chan, and she works with this incredible singer, Philip Chia, who has two ranges and. I thought, I really want to do something for them, especially since they performed a work and and really spent more than a year putting time into making this happen. A work of mine that I had written like more than 30 years ago that had never been played that was deemed unperformable because (laughs) the vocal line was so crazy, it was so, so all over the place. 
uh, in terms of its range. And the piano part was so relentless and so, you know, just like constantly, it, it doesn't let up. It's like corporal tunnel syndrome every single song. And, you know, I, when I was younger, I was a little bit more impractical than I am now. I think I'm, I'm still impractical, but maybe a little less so. But they devoted the time and energy to making that piece finally happen, to finally giving birth to it. So I thought, okay, I have this commission. I should do a new piece for them. I should do a piece that's specifically for them. And I wanted to find poems that would make sense for somebody who could sing in two different ranges. And I chanced upon these poems by Stephen Crane. Now, Stephen Crane, probably most people will know from a novel called The Red Badge of Courage. I imagine all of you had to read that in high yes. school. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that's pretty much all anybody knows. A, a few more adventurous readers might know Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, which was a, a novel of about poverty in the Bowery. And some of the short stories, I didn't know the poetry at all, and I chanced upon this poetry. And it immediately struck me, because when it was first published, it was all in capital letters. And yeah. it just kind of screams at you, you know? And the other thing about it is that these poems were largely dialogues they would you know be there'd be a narrator and there would be a voice of somebody you know i met a man who said and then you'd get this quote from this person i thought that's interesting it's a second voice but it's one voice so it's 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 a dueled voice thing that requires one voice singing two voices so i found the poems and the other thing about them is you know i'm very careful when I set a text, I don't like to have music setting a text that's not somehow true to that text, that's in any way anachronistic. And, and here's a guy writing in the late 19th century. You know, I don't write late 19th century music, per se. Um, I write music that has a lot of extended harmonies that came out of the kinds of things that late romantics were doing, but it doesn't function that way. And here's a guy who in the late 19th century was kind of breaking through to the 20th and 21st century, a time period that he never lived to see. He died really young. So his poetry really foreshadows a lot of the experiments, say, of Ezra Pound and the symbolists. And you know, he was writing this stuff in the 1890s. So I thought, yeah, I could be true to these texts and could create music that would serve these texts in a believable way. And in a and way... The texts are the texts are, are very strange, too. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> well, one thing that I, I thought was, you know, really, you know, important was to let the texts somehow guide me in terms of the kind of music that I was going to write. And I think we were talking earlier about the third song in the cycle. Yes. Yeah, which is which is called. Um, I'll I'll read the the poem to you. I'm gonna. They're they're all very very short, short poems. If you wait a second while I scroll up on my Palm Pilot here, it says yes. Here it is. It's called a thousand tongues. Yes, I have a thousand tongues, and nine and ninety nine lie. Though I strive to use the one. It will make no melody at my will, but is dead in my mouth. That's the poem. <laughs> very, very happy stuff, right? Yes. Um, so I, I thought, okay, how do I create 9 and 99 lies? Well, it's interesting. He didn't say 999. He said 9 and 99. And obviously, poetic license, you, you know he means 999. But I thought, okay... 9 and 99 is 108. And so I start, which is already a lie, because it should be 999. And I thought, if you have a beat of 108, and you keep shifting, and you keep doing these metric modulations so that the downbeat keeps changing, the rhythm is a lie. And I decided to have 108 false cadences chords going to chords that they could go to but that they shouldn't go to that aren't really the right place to go to so nice. you have a hundred and you have a hundred and eight false cadences so you have harmonic lies and you have this metric modulation 
of the beat constantly changing from a basic grid of downbeat of a beat equaling 108 beats per measure. So you have rhythmic lies that refer back to this 9 and 99. And that was sort of my departure point for that song. All right. Well, let's let's listen to it then. Uh, this is uh, A Thousand Tongues uh, by our guest, Frank Gioteri, and performed by Frank's wife, Trudy Chan, uh, on piano, and uh, Philip Chia. Is that how you say his name yes. again? Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure. Philip Chia. Uh, and in this song, we'll be singing male soprano. Yes. So it ends there, uh, and that was Frank O'Terry's uh, uh, Versions of the Truth, third song, uh, A Thousand Tongues, uh, again, performed by Philip Chia and the male soprano there, and Trudy Chan, piano. Um, and and there is uh, some some shuffling of cards, you said, that happens at this point, Frank? Oh, there's <laughs> there's there's a poem. It's, a, it's another crazy poem. Um this is the seventh poem in the cycle, the, the seventh one I set. And the text for that is, as I, I'll read you that text again. Sorry, I'm getting it up here. A learned man came to me once. He said, I know the way, come. And I was overjoyed at this. Together we hastened. Soon, too soon, were we where my eyes were useless, and I knew not the ways of my feet. I clung to the hand of my friend, but at last he cried, I am lost. And that's that text. And I thought, okay, how do I create music where your eyes are useless, where, you know, where people are getting lost? So I thought about the sequence of chords. There are all these possible seventh chords and voicings of them that contain the pitch A, because A is the pitch of truth in this entire cycle. So it's all these half-diminished sevenths. And, and once again, all these harmonies are all chords that could have been used in the late 19th century. They're all 
either half diminished, full diminished, or dominant seventh chords, and all these different inversions of them. And I did all the ones that were possible on A, and I put them on cards, little index cards. And what happens is that the players have to take these cards and shuffle them. And then those chords get played on the piano, and it's a different order every single time. And the vocal line is given just in terms of higher and lower, and the singer is told to harmonize as best as possible within those chords, which are always going to be different in every performance. The only trick is there are 19 chords, there are 12 phrases, they don't line up. Mm -hmm. And so I am lost. What's going to happen is one is going to end before the other does, and one will keep going, either unaccompanied. What's amazing about Philip and Trudy is they work so well together is so frequently they wound up ending at the same time. <laughs> they wound up actually not getting lost. I'm like, no, you guys don't get it. You have to get lost. <laughs> um, you know, they, they actually found a way to, you know, to do right by this, but the idea was for them to do wrong by this, to, to purposefully get lost. Let's see. So you you right. wrote this piece for not superhuman musicians, but normal ones, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. <yeah. laughs> so uh, one thing, I, listening to you talk about these two songs and reading your your notes for your program notes for the other uh, songs, um, one thing that I think is really interesting is is your kind of uh, stream of consciousness between the the interpretation you have of the poem and then the generative ideas for the the notes is not something that is is particularly uh going to jump out at someone who's who's just hearing it for the first time but it's it's a fun uh almost the kind of thing that that one would that that you might do for your own amusement while you're writing it like oh how can i take this little idea and transform it through this these these couple of links into this chord progression and then this this uh this shuffling of these seventh chords based on just the way this one little turn of phrase in the poem works uh, and I, I think it's a, a, a fun thing is that something that you do uh for the the musicians that you're working with or to maybe kind of amuse yourself it's it's just something that we've seen in some of the other music of yours that we've talked about on the show as well yeah, um, you know, I would say, I mean, ideally, it's something that I do think people could hear or that I would want them to be able to hear. You know, this a lot of the, these sort of sonic adventures you know, began with that that first that that piece that that Trudy and Philip did that's over thirty years old. That each song had a different interval and that kind of played through it. And because you heard that interval over and over again, my thought was that you would be able to hear that there were these intervals that were small, that were gradually growing larger and then getting smaller again, that you were making this, this full rotation. Another piece from fairly early on was a, a palindrome for solo piano that only had seven pitches in it. And the idea was there's all this music that, it's been written since, you know, Guillaume de Machaut, Ma Fin and Ma Commencement, where it goes in one direction and then it goes backwards, but you can't really hear it. And I thought, well, I wanted to write a palindrome that you could hear going backwards. And yeah, you're right. If somebody's just listening to a recording, they're not going to necessarily know that the seventh chords were generated by shuffling a deck of cards by the performers before the performance. But if they're at a live performance, they'll see the cards, you know, they will know. They will actually watch that process happen. And, you know, there are certain things that I think that you can hear. Like there's another one of the songs, number six, Pursuing the Horizon. It has 13 beats per measure. And, you know, it's going by really fast. And so unless you've got really, really good ears, you might not necessarily be able to know. It's it's 13 beats per measure and, and the, the beat is, is 360. So it's like, it's really fast, um, but it's 360 because there are 360 degrees in a circle. And if you're pursuing the horizon, you're, you know, you're spinning 360 degrees. And, you know, will people hear that? They won't maybe necessarily know all the details of the tech, the technicalities, but they will know that it's moving really fast. It doesn't sound like it's stable. It's constantly going someplace else and not quite getting there. I think those are things that you can hear. And, you know, I, 
I aspire for all of these ideas. They they are sort of tricks and games that I enjoy and I enjoy playing them, but they are really designed for people to hear them. And hmm. you know, it's it, whether or not they will who knows, but I want them to be heard. Well, and and I think <laughs> yeah. absolutely there's there's you can hear a lot of the stuff that you're talking about that's closer to the of the, the part of the process that's the closest to the sound that you're talking about. I think you can you can definitely hear, and I think as you said in the performance, you would see the 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 generation of the 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 order of the chords, but the connection between that and the 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 nine and ninety nine being hundred and eight, I think is is a little trickier to hear. Um, and yeah, but that's about dishonesty. Exactly. Know? No, and I think that's that's so what's that was fun. the idea. That, that's <laughs> that's like a fun thing for you. Well, right? okay. I mean, what you're going to hear is you're you're hearing. I mean, you just heard it. It's, I, I can ask you guys, having just heard it. You know, you hear all these chords that keep going somewhere, and they ultimately don't go anywhere. Right. They keep going, and you know, you get to this ending, and you you cut it off before the very last chord. But in a way, it doesn't really matter because it's not going to resolve. It's just going to go to some other chord and it's just going to keep wandering. And I think you can hear that. And whether or not, you know, you could say, oh, that was the 108th one. You know, I guess if you sat there and counted, you know, you would realize there actually are 108. But I don't know if that level of specificity matters. It definitely, it matters to me in terms of creating it. But there's, there's a part of it that you're going to get. And I think that if you follow along and say, well, God, this guy's a nut. You know, he's, he's doing this. I bet there are 108 chords. And then if you look at the score, you'll see that there are. Yeah, no, and that's, for, the, for, that, know, for that listener, I think it's a really great little, because the, then they get that moment of discovery, which is always a, a wonderful experience. But of course, yeah. you know, if they read the program notes, I'm already giving it all away. It's like there are no secrets to this recipe. Your, your, you know, your program giving... notes should begin with a spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right, right. Well, this is I versions when, of the truth. I like when pieces have emergent qualities like you can, yeah. you can retroactively hear it differently after you learn something about what was happening. Yeah. Or maybe that might inspire you to want to hear it again. Mm-hmm. And um, one thing you know. we didn't talk about was how you use the two voices of this same singer, the baritone voice and the and the soprano voice, is is uh, is based on the the poetic voice um, in the in the crane that you're setting. Um, and it's if if I hadn't read the program note before I got the recordings, I think it would have been really shocking because the first two songs that we didn't listen to are baritone and, and relatively low baritone register at that and then all of a sudden in that third song that we listened to there's this very brilliant uh sound of the 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 high male soprano register kind of comes out of nowhere uh from the perspective of the previous two songs and it's really striking uh and it's it's an interesting juxtaposition and it's i understand it, it follows the shift in the in the poetic voice to to first person at that point um and yes. it, it really highlights that it, it really makes me listen to the words more at that point good that was the goal i mean the goal is it it's all coming from the poetry and in fact those very first two songs um are all about a man being unable to sing and I worked at the very bottom of Philip's register, and he said, well, these notes are kind of too low for me. I said, good. That was the point. I wanted mm -hmm. it to be below what he could do, because the meaning of the poems was about this, you know, essaying to sing, this effort, this struggle, and I wanted that struggle to come across in the music. So then when you get that final brightness, when the voice finally shines in that third song, you you suddenly get this this moment of epiphany, but it's it's kind of a delusion because it's all about falsehood and lying. And then the subsequent poetry are these constant dialogues between the character, between a narrated voice and and a quotation from somebody who who the narrator has met. And you know those use the two voices in juxtaposition. But I think you know, yeah, I like the idea of listening 
to the piece cold and maybe not knowing all the tricks that are going on, what Sam was saying, and you know, maybe wanting to go back to it after and hear how the tricks play out. But I do think it's a good idea to read the poems first, and I'm working under the assumption that you know, these poems have been around for over 100 years. They are, they are out there, and this is my response to them. So these are things that people could theoretically know about before they heard the songs. That's interesting. I like the idea of of setting the poems as a response to the poems themselves. In uh, in I I don't know why that's that seems unusual. It seems that in 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 some ways that when you set a poem, maybe the first thing I would think of is that you and the poem are going the same direction. But you, what you're saying is you, there's a, this dialogue between you and Stephen Crane across 112 years. Yeah, well, it's a little bit of both, you know. I mean, it's it's. I, I've been I've actually been thinking about this a lot. There was this website, um, this website that gives piano lessons. Did this interview with me, and they asked me some questions about why I write music the way I do. They were actually pretty provocative questions, and then they were talking to me about my journalistic stuff. And I I came up with a statement that I as I was talking to them, and I realized it's really true in a way. I, I write a lot of vocal music. I do instrumental music too, but I write a lot of vocal music. And when I write instrumental music, it's usually generated by my responding to something. And certainly when I'm writing about music, I'm responding to something. So pretty much everything I do is a response rather than an initiation per se. And I would say that when I'm writing about music, it's music that's generating words. And when I'm writing these settings... It's words that's generating music. So it's sort of kind of the flip side of the equation. There's there's always a response. There's always a dialogue. And obviously, you know, Stephen Crane died a century, more than a century ago, and long before I was born. So he doesn't get a chance to talk back to me. I only get a chance to talk back to him. It's a little bit lopsided. Um, it's... Um, but it's a very personal thing. It comes out of really loving reading and really being attached to the written word and to language and hopefully serving it. You know, it's yes, it's a dialogue with that text, but I also really think it's about putting the text forward, really making it the centerpiece. And and for me, you know, when I work with singers over the years, they'll say, Oh, oh, I got that pitch wrong here, and I got this wrong here, I got that rhythm wrong here. I'm like, you know, the most important thing that to get right is the text. The words are more important than whatever note or rhythmic value I assign to it because all of those things are coming from the text for me. Yeah. Well, I think that is where we're going to have to leave it. Thank you so much all for right. being with us this morning, Frank. It was great talking to you. We really enjoyed talking to you. And... and I we don't often give the pick of the week enough time, uh, and we we didn't still didn't do it quite justice this time. But we did really get into it, and I, I enjoyed talking to you about your music. It's delightful. Uh, so thank you for your time. Do you have anything that you want to plug that you have coming up? Anything that I want to plug? Well, what I will say, I, it's not for me per se, but Philip Chia and Trudy Chan are doing an entire concert of Ned Roram songs Ooh. on November first. And, you know, a lot, he's actually a huge influence on me and how I write my music. It's always been a compositional hero to me. And, you know, a lot of times people will hear that and say, that's strange because, you know, he's, he's really old fashioned composer. And it's actually not true. I've, I've actually called Ned Rorman print a proto post minimalist because he writes these, these constantly spiraling phrases. He actually loves seven beat cycles. There are tons of pieces of his that have seven beat cycles. Anyway, they're doing an entire concert of Ned Rorm's music on November 1st. If anybody happens to be in New York City or can get a cheap flight or a bus ride um, or a train ride from anywhere else in the country or the world you might be, I guess plane for anywhere else in the world if you're going overseas, um, at the Church of St. Luke in the fields which is friday november 1st uh at 8 p.m and what else can i plug um but we should also point out that concert um highlights ned Worm's 90th birthday which will be yes. next week yes indeed and um and also i'll plug if you like the music you heard today versions of the truth is not available on a commercial recording yet hopefully somebody from a record label is listening and We'll want to make something happen with that. But you can pick up the score on scorestreet.net. So, you know, if you want to look at it and 
read the notes and play through some of the stuff at the piano and try to sing it. I have to tell you, it's pretty hard. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> you might have heard that um, from it. But um, mm. you can pick up the score and, and experience it that way on scorestreet.net. Well, we would encourage you all to check that out. And the, and the program notes that we mentioned earlier are, are extensive and you can, you can follow Frank's little games through them. So uh, <laughs> we'll have links to the Score Street uh, post and the notes in the, the uh, New Music USA uh, library at, in our show notes, which you can find at soundnotion.tv slash SN. If you'd like to continue this conversation with us, speaking of dialogues uh, with, with, with composers and other creative people, we would love to continue these conversations with you on our site. Again, soundnotion.tv slash SN. You can also join us live. We do this show, Stream It Live, every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and we have a live chat running the whole time, so you can contribute to our conversation that way. Um, you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Uh, like us, follow us, subscribe to us, and do whatever, circle us or something. I don't, I don't understand. Uh, something with, with clicking and internets. Uh, and uh, you can also subscribe to this show and all our shows in the iTunes store and have them downloaded to your, your favorite device automatically. Uh, you can subscribe to us in, in other non-i devices uh, as well. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again to everyone who nominated us for a podcast award the last few weeks. We will find out next Sunday if we made it. In that case, I will then start begging you to vote for us if we did get nominated uh, instead of just begging for you to nominate us, which is what I was doing the last half of a month. So <laughs> thank you so much for watching or listening. We appreciate the audio listeners as always, and we'll see you back next week. Baby Verber.